Hello, everyone. Welcome back to More Than Amuse podcast. My name is Sadie. I'm Stani, and happy December. Start of the holiday season, and as of yesterday, happy Spotify rap season. If yes. If that's something that you care about, I always look Love forward it. to it every year. I do Can't too, and I don't mind when people share them. Like I think it's I really fun. I love seeing what people listen to all year. Same. I love it. Especially like how many minutes everyone's listened to and like mm-hmm. everyone's top artists. I feel like you get so much insight into like, yeah, who they are as a person. How they live their lives. Yeah, yes, it's 1000%. so much fun. Do you want to give me a very brief rundown of what did your Spotify yes. raps look like? Of course I do. Okay, <laughs> I was really proud of my top artists because I feel like it was like – well, of course, it was accurate, but like it was just so <laughs> perfect for the year. Mm-hmm. So it was Taylor Swift was number one. Of, of course. course, I'm in the top five percent of listeners. Like nothing that's to really good, brag honey. about, but like that's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, second was Chapel Roan. Chapel Roan did not make an appearance in mine, and I was shocked because I listened to her so much, but. I had her on repeat for all of October, so Mm, I guess that'll do it. Yeah, and then I was listening to the singles throughout the year too, so it kind of made sense. Third was Maisie Peters, love her to death. Then Olivia Rodrigo, and then Kelsey Ballerini. Kelsey Ballerini was number four for me. Yeah, and it was so fun because I went to three out of five of those concerts, and I missed the Chapel Roan bun by only a day. And then, like, I even logged in to buy Olivia Rodrigo tickets, and they were just too expensive. So it was kind of like fun that it was like, oh no, those really were like my top five. Those were my top five. (laughs) Yeah, my top song was "Bad Idea," right? Um, Oh, which I love. And then I had two Chapel Roan songs: "My Kink Is Karma" and "Red Wine Supernova." And then I actually had an Ava Max song. Have you listened to One of Us? No, I haven't. I remember I listened to that for like two days straight. Like I just put it on all the time. (laughs) So funny. And then my fifth one was one that I actually brought up in an episode. It was Omaha by the girl on TikTok. Like Uh I really did love that song. I was a little surprised it was five. I guess I listened to it a lot more than I thought. Yeah. But yeah, like – it made perfect sense. My yeah. top artist was Taylor Swift. I hit the top 1%. So crazy. Said my annual badge of honor is <laughs> the top. One year I got like 0.05% and I was just like, wow. I'm, Man. I haven't hit that since. Number two was Lana Del Rey. Checks Love. out. Three was Miley, which actually Ooh. surprised me. She was in my top 10. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not mad about it, but I'm yeah. surprised that she made it to three. And then four was Kelsey Ballerini. And then five, I say only slightly shameful was Daisy, aka me, myself and I. Yes. <laughs> I <laughs> Whatever. I will say on the flip side that like as an artist, also Spotify rap season is an interesting time. It can be a little bit discouraging. Mm. I think I was a little bit nervous for it just because this year I only put out two songs when like the year previously I put out six. And so I just knew that like the numbers just like, you know, it might look a little bit less. I just wasn't really focused on promoting as much this year. And so I was like a little, uh, but I I was really happy with it. It's still, and then I had people tagging me of like songs that came out in 2022, that they were like still streaming and it made their top fives. And so like, it was really special to like still see that. But for my own top songs, Antihero was my top song of the year, which it was also my top song of the year last year. Mm, so apparently I love that really song. really love that song. But I also, <laughs> I did put out a cover of that song and a lot of my listening, I will say, is probably like listening over and over to make sure that I was like getting sense. the harmonies right. Yeah. Then it was Karma, Cruel Summer, and then All of the Girls You've Loved Before. I did stream the heck out of that song when oh. it first came out. And then it was um my cover of Antihero. That was number five. So, you, go. you know, you got to be your own biggest fan sometimes. Yeah. One thing I also wanted to bring up, they give a podcast wrapped. <gasps> yes. Which is really fun. Mm. We didn't know about it the first year, but we'd only been podcasting for like two months. So I don't yes. even know if we would have had that much. True. But fun thing, our top episode was Feminine Rage, Women in Anger, which I loved. I and know. Was, I was so happy to see Yeah. That. So exciting. Definitely a forecast for the new year. Our most shared episode was Romance Novels Aren't Trashy, which is a huge favorite. Yes. That is like my personal favorite episode I think we've ever done. It was my favorite one to research for. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like when we released it, it didn't get a lot of love and I was kind yeah. of irritated. So the fact that now in 2023, like years after we put that out it's getting some love thank you 
I Thank know. you. So nice. And then 85% of you joined us for the first time this year, which is yes. very sweet of you. Thank you for being here. And um, we're the number one podcast for 27 fans. So yes. I am now in love with 27 more people. <laughs> and we were in like the top 10 for like 100 people. Yeah. Which was really mm-hmm. exciting. So thank you all of you for being here. Yes. Shout out to those who listen on Spotify. We we love you. We do. We know thanks what for the leaving majority us of you are on Apple, but thanks for listening wherever you're listening. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know what? People who listen on Spotify leave us reviews a lot more than people on Apple Podcasts. So I feel like the people on Spotify are more real. I'm just saying. Yeah. We have They're- one one-star review on Apple Podcasts. They didn't leave a review. They just leave us a rating, which was fine because I would probably cry if, if they said I something mean. I think it's my ex. Oh. <gasps> yeah. <sighs> I thought about it and I was like, huh? Yeah. You know what? Maybe. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, well, that's why they weren't brave enough to leave a review. They just one starred us. They were subscribed, um, and then I think when they unsubscribed, unsubscribed they went and changed their review because it was five stars. So they retroactively changed that. Yeah, that's what that's what I would assume. Maybe that's <laughs> like egotistical of me, but I'm gonna believe that for my own no, mental health. No, I think that's so valid. <laughs> and if anyone who listens on Apple Podcasts wants to counteract Stani's ex. <clears throat> We would appreciate it. We really would. I, I'm trying to counter every aspect of that relationship. So <laughs> if you want to help, that would be great. So true. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> well, I'm glad, glad we touched on that. Anything else? Or can we learn about the new artist to start off December? I think we should just dive in. I'm really, okay. really excited about this one. Cool. Me too. I found her last year because on Christmas, someone posted one of her paintings on one of the like accounts we follow. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote her down immediately for this year because we've talked about this. Finding Christmas people is kind of the worst and topics like it's so hard. We have such an easy time with Halloween and such a very hard time with Christmas. (laughs) And I definitely (laughs) thought it would be the opposite. I when know. we started podcasting for sure agreed so just kind of a funny thing her name is florian Steppheimer. and i've got to say i now am about as obsessed with her as i am with helma off clint and that is saying something wow so yeah yes. new new favorite right here but yeah we'll just dive in so florine Stattheimer was actually born in new york on august 19th 1871 and of course she was born into a wealthy family i'm sorry i know that's the case with the majority of people we cover that's how women <laughs> artists existed back then they were very <laughs> rich that was the only way they really were it's kind of that quote that everyone likes to talk about that it's like we the ancestors studied like engineering so that their descendants could study art and music. Mm. It's basically like as your family gets richer, you accumulate more artists in your family yeah, tree. Because okay. they have the luxury of being able to do whatever they want rather than having to work manual mm-hmm. labor. So interesting. Yeah, just how it went. But her mother, Rosetta Walter, was actually one of nine daughters from a wealthy German Jewish family in New York. And then her and um, Stattheimer's father had five children together. But her father wasn't a part of her life. He actually deserted his family and ran away to Australia. Oh. Which was a little weird to think about because. Wasn't that the time period when they were literally, like, shipping all the criminals off to Australia, too? I don't know what you're talking about, so... (laughs) Oh, they did? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I should have Googled that, too, but... I mean, I believe you. I'm not doubting your story. It literally was. It was right after. Okay, so... Between seven, for those of you who don't know this, <laughs> this is how Australia was founded by like, I guess, colonized, like not founded because there was aboriginals there before. But Correct. between 1788 and 1868, more than 162,000 convicts were transported from Britain to Australia. <laughs> and of those, about 7,000 arrived in 1833 alone. And it was like punishment for their crimes committed in Britain and Ireland. So they basically were like, here's a country. We're going to have that be our jail. Like you're banished. Go see what you make of yourself out there. Yeah. Wow. So I did not know that. 
Yeah, twenty percent of the Australian population are actually descended from people who were originally transported there as convicts. No way. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. What a weird thing about history. Like I know. Mm-hmm. So that's why there's a lot of like British influence in Australia. It's because they originally were British citizens that were mm. banished to Australia. Okay. Fun fact. But anyway, Fun he indeed. deserted his family for Australia right after they stopped sending criminals there. So hmm. cool. N- yeah. Who knows what he was doing with his life? He doesn't show up ever again. Huh. By the time she was 10 years old, they actually were spending a part of every year in Europe, cool. you know, as so the wealthy rich. do. Yeah. <laughs> By the early 1890s, two of her children had married and left the household, but then the three youngest had like a very, very close bond with their mom. They were all very, very close and they remained that way until she passed away. And they spent a lot of time in Europe. Like she probably was raised more in Europe than in the United States, I would say. So a lot of European influence. Uh, She did have a lot of artistic talent as a child from 1881 to 1886 when she was 10 to 15. She actually went to a girl's boarding school. It's called like Stuttgart's institute or something Mm -hmm. and she took private art instruction with the director sophie von preiser and then the statheimers lived in berlin from 1887 to 1888 where she continued to take private drawing lessons and then she as she was traveling throughout europe of course with her sister she had the privilege Mm -hmm. of going to visit museums and art galleries in italy france spain and germany the dream she was able to attend like all of these art museums and teach herself art history and then learn from the old masters she would critique their work in her diaries <laughs> which i think is very cool i wish we had those i want to know what she thought was yeah acceptable or unacceptable <laughs> from each of them honestly too like i i feel like that shows a lot about somebody if at a young age they feel like comfortable like critiquing the masters you know what i mean i think yeah definitely shows a fortitude and like a i don't know like knowing yourself to like be so confident in your own opinions that you feel like you can question definitely the masters you know that's such a good point because these are like hanging in museums yeah and to be like wrong don't Mm -hmm. like this like i feel like when i was a kid i was always like oh no the people who are in charge know best Or the people who are, you know, lauded as the most important, they know best. So I think it shows something very significant about who she was and her character. The fact that so young, she was like, "Mm, this is what I would do differently. Yeah, no, I love that. She also like took private art lessons this whole time. And one of her main medias was called Cassian. And okay, this sent me on like a weird little rabbit hole because I was up in my parents' house for Thanksgiving and we were eating chipotle and you know how sometimes it like it can be a little bit spicy depending on like what salsa or something yeah. you got plus i'm white and i'm a weakling um but we were talking about the fact that like oat milk doesn't get rid of the spice the way that regular the cow's milk? milk does yeah okay and so i ended up like looking up why milk gets rid of spice and oh. it's from a protein called casein so when i read that she like was taking Casey and media lessons I was like wait a second like what's the what (laughs) I was like like the protein in milk and yes it actually was um so they would take like milk-based water soluble paint okay and they painted with it and it actually has been found in prehistoric cave paintings like milk paint has been around for Ever. There's actually like Archaeology Magazine reported that researchers in the Sibidu cave in South Africa discovered residue that contained like powder ochre mixed with milk to create paint. And that's from like 50,000 years ago. And they've even found like ochre paints dating back to 125,000 years ago. And they even realized that casein was used very commonly during, like, the Egyptian era. And it's, like, found Mm -hmm. in ancient Egyptian and Chinese artifacts as, like, an adhesive Mm -hmm. or, like, a powdered pigment and then a paint. Isn't that crazy? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, wow, that is so strange. But the reason why people like it so much, it has, like, a lustrous surface and it creates, like, really vibrant colors. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also is resistant to water when they cure, which is unlike gouache or tempera paints that you can still like, if you get it wet, it will run. Mm -hmm. But casein doesn't. 
So they used it a lot for sign painting, actually, and then like illustrators and commercial artists because it is easy to apply. The consistency is really even, but it doesn't run with water. Okay. Yeah. So it was actually a really popular paint at the time. It entered the market commercially for like artists in the 1900s and then there was like a Raman Shiva Cassian paint in 1933 and they actually still sell it today Hmm. and fun fact it's very environmentally friendly unlike acrylic paints which aren't because they're plastic I know a lot of people paint with oil paint because that's more environmentally friendly and Cassian or Cassian is actually very similar to that a lot of people actually varnish between casein and oil to keep the oil from sinking down into the casein paint and it can also be used as underpainting for pastels so i learned a whole lot about paint wow (laughs) i never would have learned it if it wasn't for you right now so thank you for sharing that with me i was like that is so random so that's why i had to talk about it because i was just like what the heck (laughs) but i like wish we would have learned about that like i learned how to oil paint and i kind of wish we had learned casein paint Mm -hmm. It has kind of more of like a pastel look to it. It's really pretty. Like if you Google and check out some of the images from it, I feel like they're very, they are kind of like milky, I guess you could say, but. Oh yeah. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Kind of (laughs) milky. Yeah. They look a lot like gouache, but then it's cool that they don't, they're water resistant. So just kind of like a fun thing that I never heard about in all of my years of art education. I was going to say art degree literally (laughs) so in 1892 she actually enrolled at a four-year program at the art students league in new york which was modeled after the private art schools in paris and then while she was in germany she learned the style of german academic painting and then went back and studied with teachers like Kenyon cox Karen Siddons Morbray and James Carroll Beckwith, who had studied French academic painting in Paris. Um, by graduation, she'd actually mastered painting realistic traditional academic portraiture and nudes in both of the primary European styles. So very, very, very traditional education. Cannot mm-hmm. emphasize that enough, which is going to be extremely shocking when you see her work. Okay, I can't. I'm like waiting to <laughs> yeah. Google it. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm but just, to, remember, just tell me when and I'll look it up. <laughs> like realistic, traditional academic portraiture. That cool. I would not use any of those words to describe her later works. So cool. it's kind of fun to see where she comes from. When she returned to Europe, she would visit museum collections, contemporary salon exhibitions and artist studios. She saw the work of the Cubist, Cezanne, Mayonnais, Vincent Van Gogh, Berth Morissette, who we've talked about yeah. in the Impressionist movement, and Matisse years before the Armory show, which was like the first exhibition of modern art in America. So she was seeing things before yeah. they made it across the waters. Um, she also started to experiment a ton with her style and a lot of different mediums. She tried symbolism and favism, pointillism, and did like a bunch of stuff that was very reminiscent of Matisse, who was a I think post-impressionist. Yeah, just kind of trying a bunch of stuff out. Also, during her 20s and 30s, she had a lot of like flirtations, romantic relationships right around these times. And she wrote a lot in like diaries and wrote poems and uh, had a lot of paintings that showed that she was most likely straight. She expressed a lot of admiration for the male anatomy is how they say it. Um, However, she was like, adamantly opposed to the idea of marriage okay okay cool Uh, yes like very 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 against it she was hardcore feminist in the 1930s and she believed that marriage constricted women's freedom and it interfered with creativity and so she wrote a lot about that and she was also so feminist because she wore her white pantaloons that was only worn by feminists and suffragettes Bloomers. (laughs) Bloomers. <laughs> Bloomers, yes. Which also allowed her, like, allowed her a greater range of motion so that she could work on larger canvases. And during her years in Europe, I love this, her and her sisters would seek out theater productions that featured feminist themes and women performers. Oh, that's cool. Yep. Same as, as I am doing I know, right I was now. Like, Yay. Mm-hmm. And then they also kept like a bunch of flyers in their family sca- scrapbook. And one of them was a copy of the proceedings of the first international fem- feminist Congress held in Paris in 1896. So they were like gung ho women's rights. Cool. 
I also obsessed. think like her distaste for marriage probably had a lot to do with her dad. I yeah, leaving, which like you're allowed to think however you want, but like watching her mom raise everyone alone, she was probably like, "Wow, it would be a lot easier if you never even bothered to marry the man." You know, mm-hmm. fair. So one thing that really made a big impact on her later career in the arts was the performances of Sergei Diaghilev. I'm going to say it wrong. That's okay. <laughs> Diaghilev's, I'm butchering that, but Ballet Russe in Paris in 1912. She was very captivated by like staging choreography of the Ballet Russe. And she actually helped out with creating the libretto costumes and sets for an opera of her own that ended up cool. being based a lot on the like the art the annual art students ball des court courts arts which i think was like a huge party that they would have for all of the art students okay um and that's what her opera was based on so <laughs> she made like these costume characters with intricately sewn and beaded materials they had like theatrical dance like movements that they were placed in the little mm-hmm. mannequins. They call them maquettes. So I think they're like really tiny little mannequins. And this kind of was a huge aspect of her artwork. She also had a lot of them, the female figures, dressed in a newly invented transparent material, cellophane. Hmm. Weird to think of a time before cellophane. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, that had to be invented. <laughs> so weird every time that happens it ended up becoming a hallmark of her interior design later and a huge impact on her later career in stage sets which she did end up dallying in again later okay so we'll talk about that but her libretto opera was actually published in its entirety in a biographer barbara blomick's the life and art of florence statheimer so it did end up seeing the day light of day later i want to like read the opera or right hear it. I want that so badly now so I actually ordered her biography I don't know if it was that exact one I can Ooh. check right now because it had a Black Friday deal and I'm obsessed with her like I said and I was like I want to know more so yeah. <laughs> it's arriving on Monday oh it is Barbara Blomick but it's Florence Stettheimer a biography oh cool it was published in 2022 yeah, just talking about her. So I'll let you know if it's in there. But I'm really, really excited to get it and like look more at her paintings and everything. Like very, very thrilled. Yeah. So in 1914, outbreak of World War One happened and they were actually stranded in Bern, Switzerland for a short time before boarding a ship and returning to New York City. On returning there, she decided to just reject all of her traditional academic training and create a brand new painting style that was based on like the expressive emotions and like the immediate feeling that she had of like seeing the sights, sounds, and peoples of 20th century New York City. Hmm. What a time to be alive, right? What a <laughs> time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure like after World War One and being tra- like stranded in Switzerland and then finally making it back to New York and just seeing like the hustle Mm -hmm. and bustle of the city probably was very inspiring to her. So her mother and her three youngest daughters, who are now all in their late 30s and early 40s, all moved in together into a colorful household on the Upper West Side, and they began to hold salons. So they would invite all of these insanely talented artists to Mm -hmm. come and exhibit at their little personal salon in their house. And this included like Marcel Ducamp, Who's very well known? Um, um, yes, okay. Yeah, Marston Hartley and Georgia O'Keeffe, and then other like musician, writers, poets, dancers, and members of New York's avant garde. They were known for their sophisticated interests, their fashion sense, and their open acceptance of varied sexualities, which made like a really big difference. At the time, homosexual relationships were illegal in New York. Still. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And one of the things that was really great about the Stettheimer Salon is that they allowed all of their, like, gay, bisexual, lesbian friends to come and they didn't have to disguise their sexual orientation. They were allowed Mm. to just be themselves, which they were unable to do at other artist gatherings. Like the Arzenberg Salon, which was, like, a really popular salon in New York at the time. They didn't have to worry about that. That's awesome. Um, 
yeah. So just really inclusive and I'm sure wonderful for everyone to just go and relax and still enjoy like that coming together of artists without having to worry about any repercussions. And they continued this like in their Manhattan homes, but they also did it with their rented vacation homes in Terrytown or Seabright at different times of the year. So they were like constantly having salons. What a dream little life. I know. I'm like, I want to go. Yeah. Like, can I be invited? <laughs> yeah. Go back that. in time. Get a time machine just to go to their one of their salons. Right. Actually. Uh, they're just like these eccentric older women like throwing a party in their Manhattan apartment and that's, inviting all of these that's a eccentric <laughs> avant-garde New York people would love. Yeah. Uh, she would also like preview her newest paintings to her friends at salons prior to sending them to exhibitions. And her older sister was known for creating like special cocktails and dishes such as feather soup, which was like a signature dish. And then during the summers, they would hold day-long salon like parties for friends at their rented summer houses. And mm -hmm. she painted a lot of these gatherings of like family members and friends enjoying outdoor festivities as well. It just sounds lovely. Like what a yeah. life. In 1915, um, one of her like most famous paintings um, mm -hmm. came about this time. It was at the age of 45 and she painted a naked over life-size self-portrait a model, nude self-portrait, which combined elements of past controversial nudes, including Manet's painting of the prostitute Olympia and Goya's nude Maja. And it's one of the That's earliest cool. nude self-portraits of a woman in Western art history. I love mm -hmm. that she recognized like past controversial yeah. nudes that are like famously done by men and then incorporated it into a self-portrait of herself. Yeah. Just incredible. Like I think it shows a lot of like not only like her feminist education but also like her art education too mm -hmm. which is very cool she has like a humorous mocking expression in the portrait <laughs> which they said is like very contrasting to traditional paintings of nudes and this also makes it the most mm. the earliest known overtly feminist nude self-portrait by a woman because she's like so kind of laughing <laughs> Which yeah. no one did that with nude portraits. They were like very serious or. Um, and she continued kind of like this idea of like female oriented contexts and in an unusual way, including like the 1921 painting Spring Sale at Bendel's, where she captured like women of varying body shapes, trying on clothing in an expensive department store. Um, or she has another painting called Natorium undine which portrays nude women riding on floats or swimming on half oyster shells and <laughs> on the okay. right and yes <laughs> and then on the right in a sexual reversal from traditional subject matter a group of women dances around a handsome male exercise instructor whom they admire for his physical appearance it's like a complete reversal of gender norms i love her <laughs> are you kidding yeah. me just so cool and her paintings are, I don't even know how to describe them. I They're just like, finally Googled them. And I was going to tell you to love, mm -hmm. right? They're like whimsical. They're so whimsical. So colorful. I feel like it's a similar color palette, honestly, to Hilma off Clint. But not even necessarily. I mean, they're so Hilma off Clint had a lot of Hilma off Clint writer. Yeah, yes, but it's still kind of true. like, instead of completely abstract, like him off Clint, these are, you can tell they're people, but they don't really have yes. any distinguishing features. They're like little mm -mm. shapes. And I, I love, love them, them so, much. so much. They're just so yes. cool and like beautiful. And I'm obsessed. Already like an Amazon book popped up of like the painting poetry and I'm like, yeah, I want that coffee table book. I just want to be right? able to flip through her paintings. That's amazing. Ugh, I am so obsessed with them. Like, they're so cool. And once again, this is a plea to all of you who listen or watch on YouTube. Go follow us on Instagram because I will yeah, post, we'll post these. these. <laughs> yes. During her lifetime, she actually only had one solo exhibition. It was at Nobler wow. in 1916. And it was organized by the painter Albert Sterner's wife, Marie Sterner who was one of mm. the first woman gallerists in America. And she That's worked cool. as an intermediary between the artist and the gallery. And so it had a lot of like her early Matisse derivative, derivative works, which 
was a little different. But when nothing sold, she was like vaguely dissatisfied, as said. But then later, as her style evolved and she created kind of this like, I don't even know how to describe it, just like complete rejection of traditional formalism and like this modernist mm-hmm. abstraction kind of. It was, yeah, literally, it's like mini- miniaturized, theatrical, colorful works. Mm-hmm. And this was very similar to like her designs for that early opera where she created like little figures dressed in pretty Mm. colors, like posed in movements. And so like very, very similar to that. And she would create like identifiable family members, friends and acquaintances in it as well. So like even though we can't tell they are, like there were different Mm, characteristics mm -hmm. that she would give them. So like people could tell who they were, which is so fun, like little Easter eggs of all of her friends and family. And I read a whole article about it and they talked about how like each canvas, you have to look at it as like being arranged like a stage with like the little players all Mm -hmm. placed exactly how they would be in like her production or whatever she's presenting. So it's like she's Um, like painting like a scene from a... Yes. From the theater. It's like a little theatrical production that she's putting Mm -hmm. on with like little miniature people. I Um, feel like that fits. It's like a, yes. not like a Where's Waldo, but like kind of like looking at her paintings. I'm just like, oh, look at that little detail. Oh, and what's mm-hmm. that person doing? <laughs> like, yeah, like vibe. from far away, you can't really tell what's going on. It just looks like a, a loose pattern of a lot of like abstract shapes. Or you can like kind of tell there's people, mm-hmm. but you're just like, whoa, there's so much happening. And then the closer you get, mm-hmm. the more you realize like, oh, there's a lot happening. <laughs> like each person has a very... And then you can like very... see the little moments. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like they have a very distinct thing that they're doing and how they're interacting with the scene. And there's like so much detail and Absolutely. yet it's like not overly detailed. I don't know. It's yeah. so cool. <laughs> she also, of course, used bright unmixed primary colors a lot of the times against a flat white mm-hmm. background. She had a lot of various media that she would use. A lot of them have, like, little highly detailed humorous touches that showed, like, her biting humor. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. there's this one that she did. We'll talk about these paintings later. But there's these paintings that she did celebrating New York City. And in one of them, it's called Cathedrals of Fifth Avenue. She has a little altar boy that's trying to peek under the bride's gown. Which, like, inappropriate little boy, but, like, kind of funny that she included that, right? (laughs) Yeah. I guess she's, like, truly trying to show, like, the... The spirit of New York or whatever. (laughs) Yes, exactly. She also would do like prominent locations or accurately rendered well-known architecture so people would recognize Mm. what it was along with like the people that she included too, you know, making them so recognizable so that people could look at it and they could tell and yet it was so abstract. And throughout Mm. her life, like I know we talked about that first (laughs) exhibition, like no one bought anything. But gallerists of New York, including Julian Levy and Alfred Stiglitz, they asked her to join their galleries, and she did exhibit at a number of retail galleries. But every time they asked her to sell her work, she priced each painting at the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars so that nobody could afford them. And then when people would ask her why, she would smile and say she said she liked her pictures herself and preferred to keep them. So yeah, she didn't sell them. Amazing. I know. Wow. Yeah. So people would try to buy them. She wouldn't, but she would lend them to public exhibition. So she continued to like exhibit her work, but she wouldn't sell any She would let people see it. And she was actually invited to exhibit paintings in almost every important exhibition of contemporary art. So like, I want to stress very, very well known. This included the very Mm -hmm. first Whitney Biennial, which that's from the Whitney Museum of Art, very, very prominent Museum of Art. And that was their very first biennial. It was, she was one of the earliest group exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA. Wow. Um, The Carnegie International Mm -hmm. Exhibitions and the Salon de Autumn in Paris. All in all, she exhibited in 46 exhibitions and her large colorful works were usually singled out by art critics for praise. So people were talking about her. She was everywhere. She was very, very well known. One critic actually mentioned her specifically in like a group exhibition. So there's like a a lot of people to talk about. And this writer Mm -hmm. photographer, Carl Van Vechten, and then another painter called Marston Hartley both commented that her work possessed a very modern quality. And then he said, at the risk of being misunderstood, I must call this quality jazz. Like, 
you know, just say like it's mm-hmm. so good. And then Hartley praised her delicate satire and iridescent wit. Oh, I love that. And it definitely comes yeah. through through the paintings. So. Definitely. Yeah. So just lovely. One thing that has also been brought up a lot is that she had like this modernist approach, right? But there was like a whimsy that was very different from other modernist paintings. And two feminist like writers have written about her and said that she was unapologetically domestic and uber feminine. Her work has been variously mm. described as faux naif, reveling in simplified shapes and fauve-like colors, as rococo subversive, embracing a camp sensibility, and as a temporal modernism influenced by Bergsonian concepts of time, as a heterogeneous array, aligning Stettheimer with Marcel Proust and other literary modernists. So, wow. They just really loved that she didn't try to be masculine in her work, like a lot of the modernists. And it's, I mean, yeah, they are very feminine. They are. And I love that they bring up like Rococo subversive because it is like the Rococo period was extremely feminine and it has a lot of those same color schemes. And yet like it's so Mm -hmm. modernist. It's just really cool. Like she has a very, very unique style. The 1920s were her most prolific period. Uh, She painted like a lot of individual portraits of male friends and herself and her family. Um, like her literary contemporaries Proust and Gertrude Stein, instead of trying to reproduce what the sitter would look like, her portraits revealed their personality. So she would illustrate a mixture of their habits, vocations, accomplishments, and context. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, right? I like, <laughs> so cool. Um, she had a portrait of Marcel Duchamp and Rose Solavi, I think is how you say her name. And um, in it, like, they're kind of these smaller figures in, like, a bigger area. But then she included, like, images of a number of his ready-mades as well as his feminine alter ego, which was Rose Lobby. So it was, like, him sitting in the same room as his feminine alter ego. I don't know a ton about Marcel Ducamp. This made me want to look into him a little bit more. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I was (laughs) going to say. I'm very intrigued by that. (laughs) Um, Barbara Blomick proposed that Ducamp based his persona as Rose Lavi in the well-known photography by Man Ray on Stettheimer. So, like, saying mm-hmm. that maybe he even based this feminine alter ego on her, since they were very well-known mm-hmm. friends. She also painted individual portraits of her sisters, her mother, a self-portrait in which she's wearing an artist beret, wrapped in a transparent cellophane sheath, and a red-winged cape, and is floating upwards towards the sun. Which, like, if you're gonna paint yourself, that's yeah. the way to do it. Um, she also was known for painting, like, a lot of controversial subjects that were monumental as well. Mm. So she has a painting called Asbury Park South, which showed African Americans enjoying a well-known segregated New Jersey beach. So this is one of the earliest works of a white American artist who paint black figures with the same non-charactered features as the Caucasian figures. So she painted them as real people. Yeah. <laughs> and Which is she... so sad that that's something that we're like, wow, good job. But like, it is. Yeah. yeah. Like so important. And so that was like a really amazing thing that she's like showing them in a non-segregated setting and yet in a very mm-hmm. segregated, famously segregated place. Um, she has another painting called Lake Placid where she painted herself and various friends of various religions, including Jews and Catholics, enjoying a day at Lake Placid, which was a site known for its institutionalized anti-Semitism. So once again, just being like, look at all my Jewish and Catholic friends enjoying your lake that yeah. is anti-Semitic. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, she painted the premiere of the controversial ballet performance that she saw in Paris in 1912. And she painted herself asleep, dreaming of the dancer Nijinsky in point with the body of both a man and a woman. I don't know what made that ballet controversial. But mm-hmm. you can tell she just had, like, a really quick sense of humor that was shown in all of this. She liked people reacting. She did. She embraced it. During the 1930s, she continued to paint really large works. Some of them were increasingly introspective. 
a lot of them were returning to like familial subject matter and locations that had more to do with like her personal life. One thing that I really love is that every single year on her birthday, she would paint a floral still life. And she called them eye gaze, which was based on the word nosegay, like a small bouquet of flowers. But because it wasn't like you weren't sniffing it, it was an eye gaze. You at it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, that's adorable. Yep. And this like was also to just really show that she hated a lot of symbolism in art. So she wasn't like painting them to mean anything. She just was painting them because they were pretty. Yeah, I like Which that. I, like, I love, love that approach to art. Yeah. yeah, and every year on her birthday, like, that's just cute. Like, as a that's present to herself, she's like, I'm just going to paint, like, a little bouquet of flowers. Yeah, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah. During this time, she also spent a lot of time designing her most famous paintings that came in the 1940s. Um, but one thing to note is by the 1930s, she was second to Georgia O'Keeffe as the best known woman artist in New York. Wow. This was like a little crazy to read considering that Georgia O'Keeffe is one of the most famous women artists of all time. And the fact that she was second to Georgia O'Keeffe and yet we don't talk about her was very strange to me. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. Like it's crazy how it's like they could have been that big of a deal and yet I don't know her. I know Georgia O'Keeffe. Yeah. I think that's a pretty standard name for people to be aware of as like a woman artist. That's like one of the ones you make. Definitely. Like that, Georgia O'Keeffe comes up all the time. And granted, yeah. she's very talented, but still, it was just kind of crazy to think that like Florian Stattheimer was barely behind her in yeah. like how well known she was. And yet it didn't stick. And we'll talk a, a little bit about why later, but mm -hmm. just kind of crazy. Like it's so weird hearing about how famous these people are. I know we talk about this all the time, but it's so strange. No, like, it is so weird. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they, they're gone. No yeah. one cares. No and one it knows. just makes me think, like, I don't know, is it just going to continue to happen? Like, are there people that are, like, so famous now that, like, we'll just never comment on ever again? Like, which people are just going to, like, collectively, like, not care about? I don't know. I'm it's so weird. It's a little debilitating to my brain. I don't quite yeah. comprehend it. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you think you know all of the famous people. Like, we talk about Elvis and Michael Jackson and True. Diana. Like you know, like... Da Vinci, <laughs> even if we want to go back further and yeah. spe specify on painters. So it's just weird to think about that there's people that were talked about so widely, like, so well-known, and then mm -hmm. we, at some we point, we just stopped are. talking yeah. about them. I don't know. Freaks me out. Anyway, <laughs> Agreed. moment of introspection. Her most famous set of paintings was called her cathedral paintings. She actually worked on these for about 10 years, maybe 15-ish. Um, she started in 1929 and continued until the mid-1940s. And she painted these four monumental works that she considered like secular shrines of New York City. Cute. <clears throat> so that's why she called them cathedral paintings. They were yeah. like... You know, a little homage to the city. One was like the new theater and movie districts of Times Square and Broadway. Wall Street is the center of finance and politics. Fifth mm -hmm. Avenue is upper class source stores and society. And the elitism and infighting among New York's three major art museums, the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. And these, I would say, like, probably what she worked on the longest. She continued to work on them until a few weeks before she died. And they technically are unfinished. Oh. Yeah. One thing that's kind of funny, <laughs> she painted about, like, the infighting between three major art museums. And I guess one of them won because four of the – all four of the cathedral paintings are actually on display in the Met. So I guess they won in the end. <laughs> they Although won. she didn't necessarily pick for them to go there, so I don't know. But that's where they ended up. <laughs> A critic actually called them out by saying that it was the most modern in the world of works of art and said it's cinematic, historic, fantastic, realistic, mocking, affectionate, calligraphic, encyclopedia, Proustian, and even Portinus. Wow. In fact, it has everything and everything in proportion. So they were very well loved. And when you look them up, they're probably like, like if you Google just her name. Mm -hmm. Those are probably the ones that will come up as, like, the most famous. 
And I think that's one of the ones that I saw posted. I'm going to have to look. I had a really hard time finding like exact references to a lot of her paintings. Mm. Oh, here we go. Okay, so there's the Cathedrals of Fifth Avenue. Cathedrals of Wall Street has a lot of like soldiers and American flags. (laughs) The Cathedrals of Broadway is one that comes up a lot. It has the Roxy. And then she has, like, a screen showing, like, a movie star on it. And then she has, like, a bunch of people down below. There's a lot going on. These all look finished. So I wonder if the one that's not. I don't know. They look done to me. I don't know what she would have added. One other thing that she did is she did stage and costume design again. So, like I mentioned before, she did, like, her own little opera and created all the characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second time, they actually hired her to do the stage and costume design for the 1934 play, or I guess it was an opera. It was the first avant-garde opera in America called Four Saints in Three Acts, and it opened to sold-out audiences in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, The libretto was written by Gertrude Stein and the music by Virgil Thompson. And one thing that was really incredible is the cast were all black. Oh, wow. Cool. Entirely. Mm -hmm. Which for the first avant-garde opera in America, I love that. So amazing. So she designed the stage and the costumes. And Thompson was the one who invited her to design the opera when he saw her paintings in their custom frames. And then he also noticed her matching furniture designs and studio cellophane curtains like she just had a very eclectic interior design style and he was like Mm -hmm. you need to do our costumes and sets so she did um in preparation she made dolls with fully sewn costumes for each of the characters and created designs for each scene setting them in small shoe boxes and then covered the entire backstage of the opera with layers of cellophane and created palm trees cellophane and feathers and for the stage sets copied her own furniture to create them (laughs) the opera ended up having like mixed reviews but her costumes and sets won universal acclaim so like everyone was talking about them and i think i saw in an exhibit picture that some of them have like some of the dolls that she made (laughs) i don't know if it was like from that first time survived kind of but yeah i think they've got some of like her early that's cool costume designs and everything which i just think is so cool like the attention to detail to make like a miniature version of everything that you were gonna do before you Mm -hmm. create it obsessed so that was that one other thing that she did that she was not public until after her death was she was a poet um she would write poems on little scraps of paper and then they ended up being gathered and privately published by her sister eddie later um some of them were written in nursery style some offer witty social critiques and others were satirical portraits of fellow modernists she has one after gertrude stein called gertie Mm -hmm. and one after michelle Ducamp that she just titled douche Nice. (laughs) (laughs) like obviously talking about Ducamp, but yeah Mm -hmm. funny um her poems were like showing an awareness of contemporary consumer culture. They offered a lot of her critiques on marriage. Um, She wrote one poem Mm -hmm. dedicated to Marie Sterner, who was that New York gallerist who curated her exhibition. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) the poem, like, one line says, who intended to be a musician, but Albert married her. So basically saying, like, he ruined her life. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Which, I mean, can be true for a lot of marriages in that time period, so I kind of get what she was saying. You know what? Can be true for a lot of marriages today. Yeah. I'm just going to say. A little derailed, but interesting fact I learned this week is that women are more likely to put their careers on hold Mm -hmm. for their husbands than husbands are to put their careers on hold for their wives. So even though, like, a lot of women could maybe be more successful in their career, if it comes down to a choice between the husband or the wife over the... they usually always choose the husband yep and i thought that was so interesting mm-hmm. that that tends to like be even like in a household if both people are working and focusing on their thing mm-hmm. yeah, yeah if like the husband gets a job offer to move to la but the wife's got like a thriving career in new york city a then lot of the times more like likely. more often than not they'll move to la mm-hmm. i just thought that was so interesting so yeah her poems 
were assembled, of course, collected, edited by her sister, and then published in the limited edition that she sent to her family and friends. They have reprinted some of her poems and, like, her early ballet story uh, Mm. later, talking about how, like, you see a lot of just, like, her humor and her wit and Mm -hmm. just so much that shows up in her paintings, you see it in her poems as well. And they compared it a lot to, like, cellophane because there's, like, shiny surfaces, glossy protective layers, and yet it's still see-through. But yeah. People got very poetic about it. <laughs> but one other poem I wanted to read that I really loved. Okay. Uh, it's, a sweet little mouse wanted her own house, so she married Mr. Mole and only got a hole. <laughs> I love her. I love just her. Just so That's funny. So like, funny. her biting humor is so evident in everything. And, like, yeah, I just love it. I'm going to try to find more of her poems. I tried to find a couple and I, like, couldn't. Mm-hmm. I think there's a book on Amazon that has, like, her poems specifically in it. I did buy her biography and not the poems, but I'm hoping I can find yeah, some Yeah, I think that that was the one I saw. It's like paintings and poems. Like, yes. A book, so that's cool. So I know that they're somewhere. I just. I had a hard time finding a lot of her stuff on the internet. Fair. On May 11th, 1944, she actually died of cancer in New York Hospital. What's really sweet is that daily her sisters, Eddie and Carrie, would go and visit her. And Carrie actually ended up dying only a few weeks later after she passed away. And her lawyer would go and visit her pretty much every day, too. Unlike a lot of her family who were buried in a family plot, which was very common at the time, she asked to be cremated, and then her ashes were scattered during a boat trip on the Hudson River by Eddie and Solomon. So, the which is her lawyer, so her sister and her lawyer, scattered her ashes. So, she's in the Hudson River. Wow. Rest in and- peace. One thing that she wished is that she wanted all of her work to be given as a collection to a museum, Hmm. which would make sense because she was an extremely prominent artist. You would think that that would be a thing. Would be a no-brainer. Yeah, Yeah. like open a Stattheimer wing. Like what the heck? Especially these like New York institutions that are like so focused on, you know, anyway. However, after her death they realized that, like, it was too difficult to find one museum to take the entire collection. Oh, Hmm. actually, like, shortly before her death. So Hmm. she revised her will and just asked that her sisters would follow her wishes, that her works wouldn't be sold, but would be donated to museums across the country. And so she left this task to her lawyer and a lot of her friends who donated her paintings to the most major art museums in the United States, including giving the cathedral paintings to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I guess, like, that's how they did end up there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) On hearing of her passing, Ducamp actually wrote Eddie from France and asked if he could organize a retrospective of her paintings. And this exhibition was the first full retrospective of a woman artist organized by the Met. And it also included a catalog essay written by her friend and art critic, Henry Henry McBride, who I quoted a lot in this. He really loved her work. And following its run in New York, it it also traveled to the San Francisco Legion of Honor Museum and the Arts Club of Chicago. So cool. So very prominent exhibition. What happened? (laughs) Okay, so Harper's Bazaar wrote an article after her death. Like, guys, she was famous. Like, I don't know, like, to emphasize this. So Harper's Bazaar wrote an article and Carl Van Vechten stated that she was both the historian and the critic of her period. And she goes a long way towards telling us how some of New York lived in those strange years after the First World War, telling us in brilliant colors and assured designs, telling us in painting that has few rivals in his in her day or ours. Wow. So famous. However, what happened is following her death, they donated the art. But the taste in art had moved to abstract expressionism, which Mm. is very like Jackson Pollock, like very abstract. Mm -hmm. And so her paintings were frequently not displayed. And then in addition, because of the fact that she didn't sell her art at galleries or auctions, like there wasn't a lot of publicity behind it. She never made money off of a single art piece. And I think that that's really incredible. It wasn't because it wasn't popular. It was like by choice. Like, yeah, she that was a very didn't want to, mm-hmm. but it led to like not a lot of people outside of that main art world knowing her name. And so a lot of people didn't know about her. People tr- 
tried. Like there was a biography in 1963 that was released called Florence at Hammer, A Life in Art. In the 1970s, her work was revived by most prominently Linda Nochlin. Yes. Bravo. Who we've talked about a lot. She did a lot of work on that. She wrote the essay, Why Are There, Why Are there No Great Women Artists? Which a we have a whole episode read. on. So, you know, like they really tried. Another thing was like she never affiliated herself with a single well-known gallery. So like they didn't have – she didn't have like a salon that she displayed at. She didn't have like someone advocating for her work after – Mm -hmm. She passed away. And then, like, her unique feminine and, like, very consciously female gaze was, like, very different from the male-dominated scenes of abstract expressionism and minimalism of the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So it just led to her, like, fading really quickly, even after every time she was brought up. <clears throat> she went through another revival in 1995 that they did a retrospective exhibition of her work at the Whitney. And then another publication – of a biography, Blomix, The Life and Art of Florence Stattheimer. And from this point, her work influenced a lot of contemporary women and gay artists because of the decorative theatrical style, like the female gaze and everything. But in 2015, her first retrospective of her work was done in Europe, and it's been included in numerous exhibitions. And it's starting to kind of become more fully recognized of like, her significance as an early feminist artist and like mm -hmm. her influence on contemporary artists because she literally like created a whole style, but <laughs> she's still obviously not known. Like I found about, I found out about her from an Instagram page that posts work yeah. by like unknown female artists. And like, you're hearing about her on a podcast <laughs> about, about unknown, unknown female, female artists, artists yeah. um, rather than her name being everywhere. And it's kind of one of those things, like when I found Helma off Clint, that the injustice of it all just like pisses me off. <laughs> Cause I'm yeah. like, she was so incredible. And like, because of her decision to not make money off of her art, she basically was alienated from the entire she art history. Grow scene. It. That is so interesting. Yeah. Which is so unfair. The executive editor of Art News stated that her paintings elegantly make the case that she is one of the greatest artists of the 20th century and could serve as a useful model for those of the 21st. Oh, and I love that. I agree. Like, I see a yeah. lot of art trends leaning more towards this direction again of like, I know I could put that up in my home, like a print of that, yes. and that people would be like obsessed. I know. Wait, I does think that like, mean that like I couldn't even buy a print of it because she didn't want to make money from it? I wonder. I think a lot of her paintings are like there's a lot of art sites that'll let you download high mm. definition, okay, like photographs of art for free. Okay. Um. So that would be something to look into. Like, I think you could probably find one. There's probably like some Etsy shop that set them up for That's printing. True. But it's just like, you know how like sticker sleeve tattoos have been really popular in recent years. Yeah. I've seen a lot of paintings that are kind of like that too, where people will mm. paint like random objects all on a canvas together. Like a few of the mm -hmm. artists we've shouted out. And I think it has like a similar effect and style to like her yeah, work. Yeah, I can see the tie-in for sure. And I just think, like, she should be so popular. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I absolutely love it. Like, looking at her work is is beautiful. It's so pretty. It It's so I, like, pretty. I feel the responsibility. To, I mean, like, to like to share it. Oh, wait, that's what I we do know. every week. But I'm like, I <laughs> yeah. want this, like, it's like every week I'm like, dang it. I just wish, like, our podcast would go viral and, like, Sure, for selfish reasons, but, like, also just so, like, people could, like, know these I artists, know. you know? Literally, I think that's what leads to, like, most of our irritation with, like, things not doing as well. Like, when episodes don't do well or mm -hmm. something, it's, like, it's not because of us. Like, yeah, that's part of it. But, like, we're not really making money off of this. Mm -hmm. It's more just because, like, sometimes you'll research someone and we find, like, such a attachment to them. Like, you get, like, mm -hmm. personally attached to them. And then all of a sudden – maybe the episode doesn't do that well or like you don't understand yeah. why people aren't like shouting from the rooftops like look at yeah. this art <laughs> yeah literally. and that's like how it feels sometimes it's just like ah oh, everything we do and they're still being ignored it's still being ignored i know yeah i feel that well thank you for teaching me about her today that was yeah beautiful artwork she obviously lived a very fun life i want to get a time machine so we can go back and go to her right? salon for an afternoon that's Ugh. all i want Oh, and I wanted to mention really quickly, 
her painting that you should all look up, especially for the holiday season, is called Christmas. Mm. And it's actually right now at the Yale University Art Gallery. Um, she painted it from 1930 to 1940, and it's gorgeous. Mm, amazing. So it ties into the holidays right yeah, there. Yeah, that's the tie. And that's the first painting I saw of hers. Amazing. So definitely go look at that. I'll pay, post so much yes. on the Instagram and just talk about her. Tell someone. Send this episode to someone. Be like, look at this work by this look wonderful woman. Look at how woman. beautiful. Oh, yeah. The Christmas painting is beautiful. Right? I see it. I would put that up in my home. I know. The Christmas tree. I'm going to have to print some. I planned on like home off Clint for my kitchen and like the color scheme and everything matches. And now I'm like, hmm, we need to get like some Florence at Heimer going on here. Yeah. And and by the way, I I did check. You you can go on Etsy and they'll, you can get a print of her artwork. There you go. I figured they were there somewhere. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a photograph, but yeah, you can get it. Yeah. I'm obsessed. Well, again, Thank you. I'm Mm -hmm. adding her to my list of favorites. So very much appreciate it. I'm just obsessed with her. And I'll have to report back after, you know, we do Mm -hmm. some more reading and everything. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you, listeners, for joining us. Hope you enjoyed learning. Um, We mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't hurt to remind you to leave a rating and review on Spotify or podcast. Come say hi on YouTube. You can subscribe there now and watch us discuss. And (laughs) we'll be back next week. (laughs) Yes, every Monday. Every single Monday. We love it. We love all of you. Thank you you to all of you who have us in your top 10 on Mm -hmm. all of the ones we can't even see and we'll see you next time see you next time bye bye